Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Len Calabrese, President of the Board of Trustees. <clears throat> These are difficult days for the Catholic Church. These are difficult days for our world. Few know the challenges of both realities better than today's speaker at the Cleveland City Club, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick of Washington, D.C. Widely recognized and respected as one of the world's leading voices for human rights, peace, and justice, he may now be one of the most photographed, quoted, and traveled prelates in the world after the special meeting in Rome with the Pope from which he has just returned. We appreciate your in enduring jet lag to be with us here today, Cardinal. After earning two master's degrees and a PhD in sociology, then Father McCarrick was named president of the Catholic University of Puerto Rico in Ponce in 1965. He became Auxiliary Bishop of New York in 1977, and then in 1986 was named Archbishop of Newark, the seventh, seventh largest diocese in the United States. Pope John Paul II named him the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington in 2001. He is also the Chancellor of the Catholic University of America in Washington. Fluent in five languages, Cardinal McCarrick also serves on the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace and on the Board of Catholic Relief Services. He has undertaken humanitarian missions and visits to numerous war zones and refugee camps all around the world. In 1996, he was invited to serve on the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on Religious Freedom Abroad. And in 1999, he became a member of the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom. He is the recipient of numerous honors, including the prestigious Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights in 2000. Please join me in warmly welcoming to our Cleveland City Club podium, Cardinal Theodore McCarr. Thank you. Thank you. Len, thank you for that, uh, that, that very gracious introduction. It makes it uh, worthwhile uh, having one's uh, sleep interrupted for three days in order to be here. And I'm, I know I am delighted to be here and, and grateful. It's an honor to be here. I passed your, your wall of fame in the hall just a little while ago and was fascinated by the, the number of uh, some friends of mine and the number of uh, extraordinary people who have been at this podium before me. I, uh, I, I come with a sense of awe and with a, with a sense of gratitude for the invitation. Uh, I want to tell you right now how I'm going to divide my talk. Uh, almost uh, following the pattern that Len used in introducing me, uh, certainly uh, not to talk about where I was the beginning of the week would, uh, uh, would, not, would not be appropriate. And so I, I will, for the first half of my talk, talk about the uh, meeting in Rome, and then the second half talk about international freedom of religion, <coughs> freedom, international human rights, as it affects religion and as it affects many other, uh, other areas. Let me talk about where I've just come from, where I came from uh, late yesterday. Uh, the meeting that the Holy Father had with uh, the American Cardinals and with the, the uh, leadership of the American Conference was an important one. It was a historic one. It gave the Holy Father a chance to, to demonstrate again, as he had so often in the past, his, first of all, his extraordinary love for young people. We've, we've seen that time and time again when, when he gathers with, uh, with young people, when he has a chance to be with them. The World Youth Days have, have always been a, a sign of this tremendous charism that the Holy Father has. And the first thing you, you gather from the, from the Holy Father when he talks about this problem is how terrible he feels about the victims, how terrible he feels about their families, how, how much this breaks his heart because he... He, he really reaches out to the young and reaches out to children in such a wonderful way. And he, 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 this, I think, if, if anything has broken the Holy Father's heart, this is probably one of the things that can do it. And secondly, he, he has great affection for the church in the United States. It's a, a very faithful church, a very, a very wonderful church in all that the Catholic community has been able to do. And he, he made it clear that he was troubled by, 
by the fact that we've let the church down, that, that we uh, bishops and priests may have let the church down and, and have uh, dissipated the, the tremendous reverence that our people have for the church and, and that, that that has suffered in the last, uh, in the last few months as these, these terrible uh, bits of new information have uh, consistently been reported. Uh, I, I want to do, in, in this part of my talk, I want to do three things. And I, I re approach this with deep respect uh, for the Cleveland Plain Dealer because I, I want to correct their editorial of this morning. And it, 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 if you have to be from out of town in order to try to do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I want to say about, about the editorial that it, it, it was fair given their understanding of the issue, but unfortunately they misunderstood what the bishops had done. And, and I, I'm, I, I'm, I don't blame them for that. And I, I really, I have great respect for the, for the plane dealer. But I, I want to mention that when I got off the plane in Newark to run to the, my plane to come to Cleveland yesterday, the first question I, I got was from someone who had the same misunderstanding. So it, it's, it's very, it's reasonable that somehow we weren't clear. When the bishops talk about asking for two different uh, permissions from the Holy See, to uh, withdraw somebody from the, from the clerical state. They are not just asking that notorious serial uh, offenders should be removed. It, it certainly says that in, in, the, uh, in, in the, no, the second one. But in the third, it says also, we will, propose, we will propose to ask the Holy See for a special process for cause for cases which are not notorious but where, where the diocesan bishop considers the priest a threat for the protection of children and young people. So that it, it is not just, as, as I, I think the, the editorial seemed to understand, that we were only concerned about these cases when they, were, when they, they involved uh, pernicious and multiple serial offenders. That's not the case. There, there are two different kinds of things that you, you have to do. When you go to the Holy See, you ask for this, and, you, and then you have to go back and ask for the other. So that we're asking for both. It is not that the church is saying, oh, you can do it once or twice. The church is saying you can't do it at all. The Holy Father's made that so clear. We have our marching orders. And that's the second thing I want to say, that, that it, it is clear now that, that we know what we have to do. It is unfortunate that it took us so long to figure out what we had to do. But, but in doing that, we were reflecting the, the societal understanding of the time. Not to excuse, never to excuse, because uh, what I want to do is say I'm sorry uh, in my own name uh, for, for anything that, that any of us have ever done, uh, because this is so, it, it is so hurtful to young people and so hurtful to families and ultimately so hurtful to the church. But uh, this, I want to say that we, are, uh, that we are anxious to make sure that not just these uh, notorious people are thrown out, but that anyone who would do this to a child is thrown out. And the Holy Father, as, as he said, and that it was quoted, and it's so important that we quote it all the time, that there is no place in the church for a priest who would harm children. And I, I think that we, and this is what we believe, and this is what we will do. And I, I want you to know that, uh, that uh, all the bishops are, are, are together, and I think all the Catholic people are together, that we will not allow this to happen. So. We, it, when we get together in, in June uh, and have our, our national meeting, because the cardinals only represent themselves. The cardinals you know, can't, uh, I don't keep votes in my pocket for all the other bishops. So, they, so that when we, when we come in June for our meeting, this kind of a national policy will be certainly involved in, in taking care. A national policy that will, number one, say, you reach out to the family, you reach out to the victim, you reach out to the child, the young person, right away. Number two, you remove the offender from his ministerial responsibilities. Number three, you advise the civil authorities as the law requires. Number four, you send the person away to a therapeutic center so that he can be evaluated. Number five, you have in every diocese, as I'm sure we have in almost every diocese now, and will have by the time we come to this, uh, to this decision in, in June, you, you will have in every diocese a review board, mostly of lay people, 
and like in in uh, in Newark and in Washington, we've always had one where you would have a a, a medical doctor, you'd have a psychologist, maybe a psychiatrist, a lawyer, a, a person from the law enforcement agency, mothers and fathers of families, people like that who who'd be able to say to the bishop, having read all this, this is our recommendation. I think that is that is so important that we that we do that and that we tell the people of the United States that this is what we have to do and that we are going to do it, that we are in control of the situation. I, I want to say, uh, if, I, if I could, someone, one, one very gracious reporter said to me, what would be your message to the, to the people of our country? And uh, I say it'd be, it'd be a fourfold message. Uh, first, uh, how, how sorry I am, how sorry I am that, that we, have, we have wasted away the, the tremendous respect of the church that by, by so many people, uh, how sorry I am. Secondly, that we now believe that from this meeting, meeting with the Holy Father, getting our act together, we now believe that we're in control of the situation and this will not happen again. We now believe that we are, we are on the right track and so our people can have confidence, the Catholic people, everybody in the United States can have confidence that, that the church is, is, is now able to handle the situation and will, and will. Thirdly, I, I want to say, because not, not to excuse, but to say this is not just a church problem and certainly not just a Catholic church problem. This is a societal problem. If you look at the statistics that the law enforcement agencies have of the, the number of times this happens in families and in, uh, in, in schools and in situations throughout the country, this is a societal problem and we have to do something about that. There's something, there's something wrong when thousands of cases are being reported in every state and in so many counties, thousands of cases. Most of them happening in, 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 with, with married men, most of them happening in, in, in family situations, but we must make sure that, this, that, that we not only correct our problem, which we will do, but that we see how we can correct the problem of, of the society. And, and fourthly, and, and, and last on this subject, because you really didn't invite me here to talk about this, although I, I would be uh, not as, as, uh, as, as appropriate a speaker if I did not. And then fourthly, and I, I want to say this, having just had a meeting this morning with the Department of Social Concerns of this archdiocese, which is a, which is a most impressive group of, of men and women, and I, I commend my, my dear friend Bishop Pella, who's a, who I think is a great leader and, and for me a, a great hero uh, for, for putting that together. But I said to them, I, when I give talks on this and when I have interviews on this, I try to at the end say, and I want to say it here, that, you know, in spite of all these things that are, that are taking the, 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 uh, the focus of, of the church and the attention of the church in so many ways, Despite all of that, dear friends, we're still feeding the hungry. We're still giving shelter to the homeless. We're still taking care of people who, who have mental problems. We're still reaching out to educate tens of thousands of, of youngsters in inner city schools and elsewhere. We're still calling our people to holiness, so that, and ourselves, please God, to holiness too. So we're still doing these things, and, and we're going to continue to do them so that you know don't don't think that we've that we are only going down this road we go down this road to fix it but we go down all the other roads that we have to go on because the lord is telling us to and so you can be sure that we're going to do that now <laughs> now let me let me go to uh, international uh, uh, human rights in the uh, in the the aftermath of, uh, of 9 of 9 11. Uh, basically all human rights and all international human rights are, are based on uh, on the the great teaching that probably every religion has the dignity of the human person the dignity of the human person our, our holy father uh, pope john paul ii in his first encyclical uh, made that so clear the dignity of the human person it is because we are made in the image and likeness of a god who created us because for us Christians, we are, we are redeemed by, the, by the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord. 
that every individual is important. Every individual has a, has a certain dignity, a certain, a certain right to, to so many things. And that's, that's where it all starts. Human rights are, are, are many, obviously. But they're all derived from that dignity. And uh, I think uh, Thomas Jefferson, I guess, maybe, maybe really was a great teacher when he said, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The fundamental right to life the fundamental right to liberty, and to the pursuit of happiness. And the pursuit of happiness demands a lot of things. It, you can't pursue happiness if you can't have freedom of religion. You can't pursue happiness properly unless you have freedom of speech. You can't pursue happiness properly unless you have the right to raise a family, the right to earn a living, the right to, to move from place to place. So all human rights are, are, are based, uh, really, are, are, are based on that one axiom. And, and you can, you bring, you derive from that one axiom of, of the dignity of, of each human being from that. Now, so we talk about international human rights. It, it seems to me sometimes that the most important international human right is the ability to live in peace, the right to live in peace, that everybody in the world should have the right to live in peace, so that war, war is always a violation of human rights, no matter where it comes from. Oh, sure, there is a just war. Well, I'll, I'll talk about the possibility of just war in a moment. But, but it is so important that that's how we look at life, the, to, to live in peace, because life is so important. That's why we, we Catholics get, get upset by, by capital punishment, because life is so important. Life is so valuable. It, it belongs to God. And, and sure, you have to protect people from society, but there have to be other ways of doing it than by, by taking the life of a human being. September the 11th, 2001, did not change the principle of human rights. It can't, because people are always the same. People are still made in the image of likeness of God. People are still able to, to have that great gift of having the dignity of, of being a person, a human being. How has it changed our perceptions? Well, maybe it can change our standards of judgment. And let me talk about that for, for a few minutes. I remember, uh, Len was nice enough to recall that I was named to the, the uh, Federal Commission on the on International Freedom of Religion. And it was a fascinating commission because we were, we were representing many different trains of thought and many different uh, occupations, many different religions. Uh, but one of the things that joined us was the desire to make sure that that the American foreign policy did not just look at commercial interests and political interests and the, the interests of strategy and things like that, but also looked at freedom of religion. That when we deal with other nations, we, we not only might want to say to them, you get your economy in better shape and we'll, we'll, we'll trade with you. We might not just want to say to them, uh, if you you have a, a, a an area here that uh, that we could we could develop for a base or something like that, but you would also say to them, "Do your people have a chance to worship God as they want to? Do your people have a chance to 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 bring into their lives an understanding of a God who loves them and a God who who t takes them by the hand and leads them?" Do your people have that kind of a right to? Is it possible in your country so that people can say, oh, oh, okay, I, I can hear, I can worship. Here, I can reach my God. Here, I can talk to my God without somebody saying, you can't do that. So, so that, was, that was our position. Now, you know, when we, we would come up with a long list of places where that wasn't happening, and then you'd go through the State Department, of two administrations, I want to say. So I'm, I'm on, I, I want to say this runs across. Uh, and and you, they would say, well, you know, this, this country is very close to us, and this country is very helpful in this country. So our list would be whittled by the time we, we got down to it. And so you could only get a country that nobody liked. They would be on the top of the list <laughs> because they said, okay, give them that one, give them that one. We're not going to do anything with them for, for the next few years. Now, it is possible when you do that to close eyes to problems in human rights. And if you close your eyes to too many problems in human rights, then your own prism is gone. And it's hard to know, even in your own country, whether you're doing the right thing. 
let's look at the restrictions that, that, that we've, we've become conscious of in, in our government. It's restrictions on travel. We, we know that. that th those, are, those are okay. We, we appreciate that, that our, our government has to make sure that, that uh, the planes are safe and, and, and things are safe like that. No, no difficulty. We understand that. How about restrictions on, on migration, on immigration to the United States? Well, okay, in a wartime situation, you, you, you may be able to, to finesse that. But if it turns out that suddenly nobody from X is admitted, nobody from this other part of the world is admitted, then, uh, then I think you begin to worry. You begin to say, uh, what, uh, is, this, is this human rights or is this a, a, a discrimination that really has no basis in, in our society? Talk about refugee admissions. Refugee admissions are down this year. And, and I, I really find that to be unreasonable. Uh, I've had a chance. I, I was for many years in charge of our, our Catholic Church's work in, in migration and refugees. And, and I remember I told last night, and uh, Len said, tell that story again. So I'll, I'll tell that story again. I was in Hong Kong, uh, oh, maybe 10, 10, more than 10 years ago, when the, the Vietnamese boat people were, were coming and trying to find a place. And many of them had, had arrived in Hong Kong. And to their credit, the British government didn't throw them out. But what they did is they, they put them in boxes. You had a, these buildings that they had built about as high as, as that, uh, that cornice there at, from, the, from the floor. And each of them had four shelves. And the people had a shelf. People had a shelf. And families of maybe seven, eight people, they had a shelf. They couldn't stand up in it because it was only like three feet, three feet tall. And, and th that's where a family would live. And the kids, and, and th they would eat there, and, uh, and the, 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 the odors of food and, and people were, was, was so difficult. And then the kids would get out and try to run around, and then they'd have to look for them. And uh, It was an inhuman situation. And these people were saying, you know, we can't go back home. We're, we're here because it, they, weren't, they weren't commercial refugees. They were refugees who, who, who had helped the Americans, perhaps, and therefore were persona non grata. They, they were refugees who, who were so strong in their Buddhist tradition that they could not worship, or in their Christian, their Catholic tradition, that they could not worship. They were refugees who, who had offended somehow by using their speech in, in ways that the government didn't like. And they were there, and, and nobody would take them. Well. We have to always have a heart for refugees. We have to always be willing to open our hearts to refugees. Or we will forget that you know, so many of us were refugees when we came here. You know, the, 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 the Irish fleeing from, from a, a British government that didn't understand, the, 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 the Cubans fleeing from a, a, a government that, that was harassing, and, and so on and so on. But to make sure that when we look at international human rights, the right to flee, the right to escape from, from a, a, an intolerable situation, that's a right. And, and we in, in our country have to make sure that we're not, we're not avoiding it. Now, as I look at our nation, one thing has happened that I find to be extraordinarily fine in, 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 the, in the present government, and it is this $5 billion uh, fund that is going to help the poor nations of the world. Now, there's a good reason, there are many good reasons for it. Certainly one good reason for it is the hope that it will help close the chasm between the rich nations and the poor nations of the world. That chasm is going to create more and more ill -ease, more and more violence, more and more war, unless we fix it. You, you cannot keep three quarters of the world living on, on less than $100 a year. You, you, you cannot, that, that doesn't work. People need to be able to see the sunshine. People need to be able to, to breathe the free air. People need to be able to have a chance to escape the, the horrible pandemic of AIDS in, in, in Central Africa, uh, to, to escape the, the harsh governments in some places in Asia, to, to, to find a place where they can grow and flourish. 
how important that is for everybody. And, and now I think our, our country is, is seeing that and has put down $5 billion. That's a lot of money, even in today's world. And so uh, we're going to be helping on that. Most, some, of, some of that, of course, is in debt relief. And, and uh, that's something that I, I have been very much involved in. Uh, in fact, uh, when the president made a recent announcement, the only people he invited to the affair were Bono and myself. Uh, it was act actually, of all the things that I have done since I've become a bishop, the young people in my family thought that was the greatest. <laughs> but, you know, when you look at the debt situation, when you look at these, at these poor nations, and, and this is a violation of human rights, that, that we have loaned, not we, the international agencies and governments too, have loaned extraordinary amounts of money that they will never be able to repay. And that, in a certain sense, they have already repaid many times by repaying the interest. Because they, they haven't even touched the principal. It's, they, they keep paying these exorbitant amounts of interest every year, and, and they still, uh, what, what I, I can imagine, a father of a family, in trying to raise a family and seeing all the money that he has going to pay off a debt. And, and in, in, the, in some of the countries in Africa and Latin America, it is so bad because they never got the use of the money. The money went to buy munitions, the money went to buy palaces for dictators, the money went to buy crazy things that they never got any use out of. And now they're paying it back, paying it back step by step. And what is worse is that because they have to pay it back at that rate, they don't have enough money to take care of the children. They can't keep hospitals open, they can't buy medicines. They can't do so many things that you have to do to, to run a nation, to, to take care of your people, to have infrastructure that you can build on. So it's so important that we do that. Two, two things to, to get to my conclusion. We must also make sure that in our country, after 9-11, we never lose our understanding of the rules of war and the rule of law. On the question of the rules of law, you know, we, we, we teach, I think almost every religion teaches, that there are certain things that have to be uh, present if you're going to have a just war. And if you don't have them, then you don't have a just war. You know, the, the proportionate of the, of, of the, uh, of the reaction from, from one to one, the, uh, the, the possibility of success, and in a very special way, the continuing care not to hurt innocent people. Now. Have we done it so far? I, I'm not on the scene, so I, it's, it's hard for me to make a judgment. I hope we have. But I think it is up, up to all of us to keep insisting with our government and all the governments of the world that, that those rules of, of engagement which make it possible to have a defensive war. You can only have a war to defend yourself. And indeed, we were right to, to defend ourselves. We had to. But as we go along on this, we must make sure that we are following the rules, the rules that, that keep our work in this conflict just. And then secondly, and I'm, with this I, I will come to my end, secondly, the rule of law. I remember being in, in, in uh, Shanghai a little while ago, about a few years ago, and uh, meeting a professor from a law school in the United States who said, I'm here to teach them the rule of law. Well, thank God, but let's not lose it ourselves. And, and I have some worries about Guantanamo. I have some worries about what, what is happening down there. I think many of you do too. Uh, I am not, I, I'm not judging because I don't know the whole situation and I, I think you, you can't judge unless you, are, you have all the facts before you. But I think it is important that we keep reminding our government and reminding those who make decisions that the rule of law is so important, and, and we who have become a great nation because we had the rule of law continue to be a great nation because we are practicing what we, what we, what we preach. I'm proud of our country. We, I think we all are. I'm proud of what it has been able to do and what it continues to do. I, I'm, I'm proud of the, the tremendous sacrifices of the men and women in the armed forces who who are in, in maybe more difficult places than they've ever been before, trying to, 
to keep the the, the standards of, of peace and, and harmony together. But it's a challenge, and it's a challenge which we which we must always continue to do. And we will do it if good people like you are always attentive to that challenge and always courageous enough to accept it. Thank you very much. Today, today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, Archbishop of Washington, D.C. <coughs> we will return in a minute for our traditional City Club questions and answers. First, we have a few announcements. We want to welcome all of you here and all those listening to WCLV 104.9 FM, WCLV 1420 AM, or across the country on the City Club Broadcast Network. Radio broadcasts of the City Club are made possible through the generous support of Case Western Reserve University. Our weekly television broadcast partners are WVIZ, PBS, Idea Stream, and Adelphia. Television broadcasts are supported by John Carroll University and the Nordson Corporation. This forum program is also available on the internet with the support of the webcast group, and you can find a link through the City Club homepage which is cityclub.org. Next Wednesday, May 1st, we will have a special forum with Barbara Bird Bennett, CEO of the Cleveland Municipal Schools. On May 3rd, our regular Friday forum will feature former FBI Director Louis Free. Wednesday, May 8th, we will have Bernie Balkan, Chief Scientist at BP Amico, who will address climate change, counting the costs counting the benefits. And on May 10th, we will have Hassan Abdul Rahman, Chief Representative of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. If you wish to make reservations for upcoming programs or order a tape of today's program, you can call 1-888-223-6786 or 216-621-0082. We would like to Thank Key Bank for helping to provide travel arrangements to make it possible for Cardinal McCarrick to be with us today. We also want to welcome guests at our City Club President's Table, which is hosted by the law firm of Arter and Haddon. We hope they will join us in the future, and we thank Arter and Haddon for their support. I'm pleased also to welcome guests at tables hosted by St. Mary's Seminary, especially since several of them are colleagues and students of mine. Your extra credit, Cardinal. So, <laughs> with us today are students uh, who are here as part of our City Club student program. Participation of these students is made possible by a generous grant from the Jeffrey David Epstein Memorial Student Fund. We have students with us from Cleveland Central Catholic and Magnificat High Schools, and also a special group of students from Chagrin Valley Conference Schools here as part of their academician program. We'd like to have all of our student guests please rise and receive our welcome. <laughs> Now, we would, uh, well, first let me say that uh, we did want to acknowledge the passing of the husband of a longtime City Club staff person. I'm sure all City Club members join me in extending our sympathy to Lillian Anderson, who lost her husband, uh, Norman, in the past couple of days. Now, we would like to return to Cardinal McCarrick for our traditional City Club questions and answers. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Please raise your hand. And holding our microphones today are our John Carroll intern, Whitney Brillhart, and Elizabeth Orr. And uh, we'll have our first question, please. Welcome to Cleveland, Cardinal McCarrick, especially after such a very important meeting in Rome and, and for your uh, enduring, as uh, Len put it, the jet lag that you're now facing. Uh, I stand before you, Father, as a, uh, as a Catholic, as a parent, and indeed as a lawyer. Um, 
But I, I, I look at a time when the bright glare of public scrutiny is focusing on the priesthood as perhaps never before, in a manner that seeks to besmirch the reputation of the many good ministers of the church because of perhaps the sins of a few. Um, the Holy Father and the American Cardinals have come back now with a plan on how to deal with those few. But how is the church, which holds the ideals of forgiveness and redemption so very high, responding to those who call for the proverbial heads to roll among not those few perpetrators, but among those who have supervised the perpetrators, reassigning them and perhaps uh, remo not removing them in hopes of that redemption? Well, thank you. That's a very uh, eloquently put question. Uh, let me, as I begin to answer it, uh, say also something that I should have said earlier. Though the, we are still so proud of the priests of the United States. You know, when you, when you consider that you were talking about things that happened 30, 40, 50 years ago in most cases, and you were talking about less than 1.6% of our priests, in other words, almost 99 out of every 100. Now, one case is too many. I say that right away. One case is too many. And, and we, we're going to determine that we don't have that one case in the future. But you know, how, how, how much we owe the great good priests who constantly have taken care of our, of our people, like the great good uh, clergy people, men and women of other denominations who, who have been so, so great a part of this American country. Now, uh, I, uh, as, as far as, uh, as redemption, uh, I would hope that we, we are all in the business of redemption. Uh, I, I think the, the question that we need to, to face with regard to, to priests who are perpetrators are the safety of our children and our young people. And so what we have to do there is to make sure that this cannot continue, that, that they cannot continue to do that. We also have to make sure that, the, that those superiors in the church, religious superiors, bishops, and whatever, who, who have somehow not been awake to the situation are now made totally awake by it, by the words of the Holy Father and by the action of the, of the Conference of Bishops now, during the next few weeks, and in a special way at the meeting in June. I think that, that those who, who have made mistakes in judgment, uh, I, you know, you... I believe the Indians had it right, the Native Americans had it right when they said, you, it's hard to judge a man unless you walk a mile in his moccasins. So I, I, I cannot judge those who, who have made these mistakes, but I, I, I can certainly say that they will, those mistakes cannot happen anymore. And I think we, we, will, we will see that uh, in each individual case that uh, a bishop and, a, and those who are responsible will apologize to the people and give them, for their work, the same assurance that I would love to give you now on behalf of the whole church. Cardinal, uh, we always like to welcome our guests with a few softballs at the outset. So uh, uh, I ask you something which has actually uh, been on my mind as I have traveled uh, over many years. Uh, for you strike me as a, a wise and generous person. As a person of devout faith in one religion encounters others of devout faith in a different religion, sometimes a drastically different religion, do you have any counsel for us on how to reconcile one's own faith, one's profound faith, with the notion somewhat contradictory that one should accord fundamental respect to someone whose faith is, in fact, at variance with your own devout beliefs? Well, I, uh, that is a very thoughtful question indeed. It seems to me that you, you, you have to begin where I began earlier, that we are all children of one God, and that the, that the God who created us loves us and wants us to, to love each other. I was secretary to the servant of God, Terence Cook, who was the great Archbishop of New York years ago. And he would always say, we are all brothers and sisters in God's one human family. And I think that, that, 
gives you the context of, of all these things. Certainly, there are many differences in, in many religions, especially we are now uh, understanding some of the Oriental religions much more than we understood them before. But there are, there's a thread through the great religions of the world. A and that thread is that, that God loves us. And that thread is that we should be at peace with each other. Uh, you know, they, sometimes you, you, you hear things about one religion that it is a, it is a, a violent religion. It, that's, that's really not true. If you read the holy books of, of, of Christianity, of Judaism, of, uh, of, of Buddhism, of, of the Hindus, of, of, the, of, of Islam, the holy books really talk about a God who, who reached down for us and wants to draw us all up together. Now, we, every, every one of us who is a, a believer uh, has his or her own uh, set of, uh, of understandings of, about that God. But as we get to know each other better, we, I think, uh, I, this is in my own life now, I, I have to admit, maybe not in everybody's, but in my own life, I, ha I have found that I get to understand the way God works with other people so much better as I get to know them, as they get to talk about, about their God. Now, we who are Christian believe that Jesus Christ is the, is the sole and unique Savior of the world, and I will die for that. But I, I know that, that, through that through the grace that comes from God, uh, others have found in, in, in some way that God works so wonderfully in lives, that same call to holiness, that same call to peace, that same call to love with each other. I think if we get to know people and we talk about religion, we will find that there's much more common ground than, than we thought in the beginning. And thank you for the softball. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming here today. We sure appreciate it. As a Catholic, uh, with all I've read and watched and listened to, uh, I have yet to see where there's any plans for involving people like myself, the laity, in this uh, policy-making process. Are there plans to involve us in any way before that meeting in June? Yes, yeah, very definitely. Uh, I have always had in my dioceses a, a review board of lay people. Uh, I think I mentioned it as the, as the fifth of those programs. I think that is going to, to, to happen in just about in, in every diocese in the country. And I, I would also hope that we might develop a, 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 an advisory commission on a national level of some of the most prominent uh, Catholics in the country. Some people who each one of us will say, yeah, I can trust that man, I can trust that woman to come up with the right decision. And, and as we get people like that together, there will be certainly a role for lay people. If I can just tell you a funny story. When we got ready to, uh, to, to begin to figure out what should go into a communique, I said, now, we have to have something that involves the laity. And all the bishops, cardinals, immediately said, absolutely, we have to get it in. And then we said, national, diocesan, local, has to get in there. And we all said, okay, that's, we, that we definitely has to get it, have to get in. Writing a communique in, after a two-day meeting in three languages, when everybody has their own words to say, we uh, came to the, we finally got it read, got it written, and we came to the, the press conference, and I, I was one of those who were at the press conference, and they said, how about the laity? And I said, well, that's in there. Didn't you see it? They said, it's not in there. I said, certainly it's in there. We put it in. It's not in there. And, and it's, it's, it's the, glaring, uh, the glaring absence. You're absolutely right. The, you know who is going to restore the credibility of the church? Be the lay people. Really will. And, and by your faith, and by your work, and by your faithfulness, the church will, will grow again. So it's in there, and it will be in there. We'll all insist that, that the role of the layman and the laywoman is clearly uh, underlined and made. Please involve the ordinary Catholic along with those Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and certainly on, on, the, on the national level, we'll have the well-known, but on, the, on our local level, we, we certainly have to involve the, the ordinary. Thank Good point. 
Yes. Um, thank you for coming. My question, you touched on human rights and you mentioned uh, the AIDS epidemic in Africa. And um, I have been doing some research and I guess my question is, well, one of the major problems that they face in the sub-Sahara region in Africa is that their, um, their religion, and most of them are Catholic, um, really prevents teaching safe sex. So from a religious standpoint, like how can we get across to a lot of these citizens? Because a lot of the children and young adults who are their future are either born or being um, forcefully raped by citizens and they get infected and they don't actually have a choice. So how can we address um, their religious beliefs in helping them like prevent the, the AIDS? Well, for, for, the, for those who believe as we do in the Catholic Church, uh, we, will, we have to recommend abstinence, that they do not spread this, this terrible disease. And, and that is a, is a tremendous challenge to, to everybody. Uh, but you, you don't solve a, a terrible scourge by adding another one. By, by moving away from, from morality, by moving away from what is right. Uh, we, that's why we have to work so hard to come up with something that will, that will overcome this, this AIDS problem. We have to put much more of our health, uh, money, much more of our, of our, of our work to, to curing this, this pandemic. Uh, I think that's the way I would say to do it and, and, and not, to, not to violate what we really believe is important for for marriage, for for family, for for the growth of for the growth of children. But I I, I know what you're saying, and I, I know my answer is is not the easiest answer. And with that, I think I've gotten rid of the light. <laughs> That's a first. <laughs> um. Could you, do you have, how many Catholics do you have in the Middle East, in the church there in Palestine, and do you have any insights into the problem there that we may not have, and any role in what could help us make peace there? What well, is the role of the Catholic Church? Is there any contact between you and, the, and Rome? And yeah, well, I, if, if I had those answers, uh, I was going to say I could win the Nobel Prize, but I think if I had those answers, I could probably be beatified. <laughs> and I'm far from that. Uh, yes, I, I am very frequently in, in contact with, because of those international responsibilities that I had in the past, and I'm frequently in contact with the, the bishops of the Holy Land, the Catholic bishops of the Holy Land, and I know their suffering. Uh, they are representing a, a people, the, the Christians there, who are really, they don't like us to say it, but it, I, it's, it's, it's an easy way, it's a, a shorthand way of saying it. they're a double minority. Uh, they, are, they are Arabs in a Jewish state, and they are Christians in, in an Arab majority, so that they, they are facing uh, tremendous trials. Uh, and when uh, in, in, in the, the effort to, to uh, pacify areas, uh, Catholic uh, enclaves are, are hit so badly, Christian enclaves hit so badly, you, you worry about the future there. Holy Father has always said that the, what we should have in, uh, in the Holy Land is a living community of believing Christians, not museums. And as, as the, the difficulties of the Holy Land continue, more and more of the Christians are emigrating, they're leaving, because they see, they see no future there, they see no possibility there. Uh, the, the, the situation in, uh, in Bethlehem, of course, is a, is a dire situation. And uh, I know that the, the, the church has tried to, uh, to negotiate as best as possible uh, we have attempted to be present to uh, uh, to the to the people, the these poor monks who are 
uh, who, at, at least up until, up until a few days ago, I didn't have any information when I was in Rome, but up until a few days ago, had no water, no medicine, no food. And these are, a lot of these are older men who, who, don't, have, uh, who don't have the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to, to find. I think that uh, certainly uh, I, I don't have any answer except that I believe we have to do everything we can to get people back to the table to talk. And uh, you know, I don't care who gets them there, but we have to make sure that conversations are going on. Because if they are not talking, they are killing each other. And that's certainly not, not what God wants in his holy land. Uh, Cardinal. Over here. Yes. I'm in the corner. On oh, the corner. Hi. There you oh, are. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Um, I guess this is a why question. I mean, I'm a practicing Catholic, have been my whole life. And uh, I, I recognize that, this, as you said, it's a small minority of priests, uh, very small, that have committed this act. And I'm sure all those priests wish they didn't have that illness of pedophilia and sexual. I mean, it's not something anybody wants and they'd like to eradicate it from themselves. I guess my frustration, and I think the frustration I read about and feel from a number of Catholics is why it took the church, and Rome especially, so long to acknowledge this problem. I mean, I give American journalism a great deal of credit for bringing this issue to light in the last several months in a way that uh, hasn't been uh, just a firestorm for the sake of exploitation, but really needed to be said. I mean, up as little as two months ago, one of the three cardinals in Rome, the trilogy was saying it, part of this was due to sort of the licentious behavior of uh, Americans and their morality. And it seems to me it was only until this firestorm came and they saw the magnitude of the problem, and in some ways I hate to be cynical that they need to protect their assets, and then in fact it may affect the church, that they act on it. And I just don't understand why it took Rome so long for you to act. And I must say I must compliment you and applaud you on saying you're sorry to us. Because some of your colleagues, other cardinals at a couple of other cities, still haven't said they're sorry or still have acknowledged, have not acknowledged their mistakes. So maybe you could just shed some light on that for me. Well, I think it, it's hard to shed uh, too much light on it because it, it's, it's just a, an almost impossible situation to understand. Uh, I don't think any one of us realized how, how, how serious this situation was. Uh, I, I think that that probably is, uh, is, is one of the basic answers to it. Uh, I, I don't think Rome realized that it was that serious. Uh, I'm not sure in the, in the United States we realized that it was that serious. Uh, I, I think maybe it is a wake-up call to us, too, that we see now how, uh, how important it is to make sure that we are, that, that we are on top of these situations. Uh, I, I think, and not, not, to, uh, not to be defensive, but to say that you know, we, we've always been aware that uh, there are problems of incest in families. We've always been aware that there are many married men who have this problem many, much more than, than celibates do. And I guess maybe we felt that, that if a man really lived celibacy, in, in, in a generous and joyful way, as, as the majority are doing, as you mentioned, the majority are doing, then that's a great protection. But there are sick people. And, uh, and see, now, one of the things that I'm so proud of is that the, the bishops of the United States have made sure that admissions to seminary are, are done much more carefully than, than they were 20 years ago. There's psychological uh, testing. There's there's psychiatric uh, uh, interviews. They they, they really they it, it is now very difficult to get into a seminary, even though we are short of priests. That we have never moved away from that. It is still very difficult to get into a seminary because you have to go through all these steps. And so I think we are we are doing our best to to overcome that now. Uh, I I think that the priesthood of the Catholic Church. Uh, has been uh, so blessed by having so many great and holy people. As you say, it's a shame that we have some people who are sick, but <coughs> let, us, let us walk away 
now from, from these terrible moments into a better tomorrow when our church and our people and all our neighbors can once again take joy in, the, in a respect for what the Catholic Church is doing. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland Forum, <clears throat> we have been listening to Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, Archbishop of Washington, D.C. We want to thank Cardinal McCarrick so much for being with us today. We want to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and this forum is now adjourned.